Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Uh, it's been great spending a few days here with Wolfgang and his team. Actually, it's my first time in Graz, in fact, my first time in Austria. So it's been great to have a chance to come and visit here. In addition to spending time with the team, got a chance to uh, walk around the city a few times. Uh, so I've really enjoyed the time here. I look forward to building on this with the collaboration that we're starting. For my talk today, I called it Sowing the Seeds for a More Creative Society. I want to emphasize the creative part of the title because I use this title because I feel that nothing is more important in today's society than helping young people develop as creative thinkers. Because I think there's one thing that we all can agree on in today's society, and that's that things are changing more rapidly than ever before. Like we just see this in all aspects of our lives. And because of that, things that we learn today, many of them will be obsolete tomorrow. So people will definitely be confronting unknown and uncertain situations in the future. So one of the keys to success in today's society, and even more so in tomorrow's society, will be the ability to think and act creatively. The ability to come up with innovative solutions to the unexpected situations which we undoubtedly will all confront. But there's a problem because young people growing up in today's society oftentimes aren't really prepared for this new society, for the creative society where creative thinking is more important than ever before. Most of the schools around the world weren't set up to prepare young people as creative thinkers. Schools were designed for an earlier era. They required different types of uh, skills and capacities for flourishing in the world. So in our work, at the MIT Media Lab in my research group, we focus on how can we develop new technologies, new activities, in order to help young people grow up as creative thinkers, so they'll be prepared to be full and active participants in a creative society. So to talk about these issues, I was going to tell you four stories that grew out of the work that we we're doing. And hopefully from these four stories, you'll get some understanding of the ways that we're trying to help young people be prepared for the creative society. My first story took place a couple years ago in the month of May. And I know it was in the month of May because the story starts the day before Mother's Day. And I know that Mother's Day is in the month of May, at least in the United States. Is, it mo is Mother's Day in May here in Austria? I heard some yes and some no's. <laughs> some of you are going to get in real trouble with your mother. <laughs> so you should find out when Mother's Day is. It's very important. So, but in fact, I had forgotten about Mother's Day. It was the day before Mother's Day, and I hadn't gotten anything for my mother. And I suddenly realized, so I thought, what should I get my mother for Mother's Day? And I thought, well, maybe what I could do is prepare her an interactive Mother's Day card using our new Scratch software that Wolfgang mentioned. This is our software that allows children to program their own interactive stories and games and animations. And I thought, well, why couldn't I, why couldn't I use it to program an interactive Mother's Day card for my mother? So before starting on creating my card, I thought I would go to the Scratch online community. Because part of Scratch is not just a programming environment, but an online community where people can share their creations with one another. So I went to the Scratch online community, and in the search box, I typed in Mother's Day to see if I could find other Mother's Day cards. So here's the website. There's a search bar here. I typed in Mother's Day. And when I typed it in, I saw a long list of Mother's Day cards on the website. And when I looked at the dates, Many of them had been created in the previous 24 hours by procrastinators like myself. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe I can look at some of these projects to get ideas for how I might make a Mother's Day card. So I started looking at some of the projects on the website. Here's the first one. There was a, an animation, I think it was by a nine-year-old girl.
So it's even, uh, it even thinks to ask if the mother wants a replay at the end. It's like, and goes, you think that the audio output, is there an easy way to get audio out from here to the speaker system or not? Okay. <laughs> You'll have to listen carefully for my, I'll crank up my laptop and we'll hope you can hear it. Uh, so this was nice. Again, it's not that it has the best spelling necessarily, but you can get the spirit of a nine-year-old girl trying to share a Mother's Day greeting and you know, representing herself and her mother with these hats. Here's another Mother's Day card that's an interactive Mother's Day card that as you move the mouse over each of the letters, it spells out, it reveals a special Mother's Day message. I love you and care for you. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. And finally, I saw a Mother's Day story uh, that plays out like this. Press space bar to start. Oh, hey. This morning, someone told me it was Mother's Day. I Googled and found out it was true. <laughs> now I have something to say to you. I love you so much. So, so when I saw these Mother's Day cards, I was really happy because I felt that these Mother's Day cards captured the spirit of what we hoped would happen when we introduced Scratch now seven years ago. Because we wanted Scratch to be a way to help all children learn to express themselves using computer programming. Our main goal was not just to help children learn to code because of future job possibilities, although of course there are great job opportunities, as some of you know. But for us, we like to see computer programming more as an extended form of writing. The same way that we don't expect everyone to grow up to become a professional writer, like a journalist or a novelist, but we think everybody should learn to write, because writing is useful in our everyday life, and writing is a great way to express your ideas to others, whether it's writing a letter to a friend, writing a Mother's Day card to your mother, writing personal notes in your diary, we see programming the same way. The programming is just another way of expressing your ideas. And that's what we saw these children doing. And we see that as very different from the way a lot of young children are using computers these days. Around the world, many children as they grow up have increasing access to digital technologies. So digital technologies are an integral part of their lives. But for most young people, they spend much of their time browsing and chatting and playing games. They don't spend time designing, creating, and expressing themselves. And for us, we think that the richest learning experiences from using computers is going to come not just from interacting with the technology, but by creating things and expressing yourself with the technology the same way you express yourself through writing. So I was very happy to see that these young people were finding a way to use the technology to express their ideas, to learn to see the computer not just as something to interact with and to browse with, but something that they could use to get their voice out to the world, to share their ideas with the world. Because I think that's going to be the way that computers become the most important learning experiences, to support the best learning experiences for young people. I should note that I never ended up finishing the Mother's Day card for my own mother. Um, instead, what I did was I collected about 10 of these cards and I sent my mother links to 10 Mother's Day cards that were already on the Scratch website. And actually, my mother responded just the way I hoped she would. She said, I'm so proud to have a son that created the software that let all these children create Mother's Day cards for their mothers. So my mom was happy, and that made me happy. But what made me most happy was the way that these young people were really taking the computer and turning it into a creative technology. And as they were creating these Mother's Day cards, they weren't just learning the logic of computer programming, although they were doing that. They were starting to develop this creative thinkers, knowing how to start with an idea and create something with new technology. So let me move on 
to story number two. And story number two took place in one of the after-school centers where we do a lot of work. We had set up a network of after-school learning centers called computer clubhouses. And in fact, it was at these computer clubhouses where we first got our idea for Scratch. But so we had set up the computer clubhouses. Uh, I started the first one with my colleague, Natalie Ross. And we set it up as an after-school center for young people from low-income communities, for young people who did not have much access to technology and didn't have access to people who could help them learn to use technology in creative ways. So we set up the computer clubhouse as a place where young people could come and learn to design, create, and express themselves with new technologies. And the clubhouses had been very successful. Children came in and teenagers came in and they used programs like Photoshop to manipulate images. They used different music software to, to mix their own music. They created music videos. But there was still a problem that a lot of the young people did want to make interactive games and animations, and they didn't have the right software for doing it. And for these young people, learning Java or C++ in order to create their own interactive game was beyond them. They weren't going to do that. And yet, some of the types of game-making software that's out there for kids was too limited. It could help you make one particular type of game, but it didn't match the imaginations that these kids had. They had you know, their own ideas, and it didn't fit within that very constrained software. So we saw that there was a real need for some new software that would allow kids to make their own interactive stories and games. Um, it was really suited to their needs. And there was nothing out there. That's what led us to start working on Scratch. In fact, this story comes from one of the computer clubhouses. Uh, the clubhouse network has expanded. There are now about 100 clubhouses in 20 countries around the world, you know, supported with funding from the Intel Foundation. So there's many places around the world where kids are coming to these clubhouses to work on creative projects. And as we were testing out Scratch, I was visiting one of the clubhouses, actually it was a clubhouse in Los Angeles, and I met a 13-year-old boy who was working on a project somewhat like this. It was a game that he had developed, and he was very proud of his game. So I went over and he was showing me his game, and it was a game somewhat like this. Where's my mouse? Hmm. Let me take a moment. Now shifting over to the Scratch software. This is now the live Scratch software. If I actually have a go to full screen mode and run the game, and what I do is I guide the big fish and try to eat the little fish. Oops, that's it. There. So again, the game was working well and he was happy with the game, but he said there was a problem. He really wanted the game to keep score, and he didn't know how to keep score. So he asked me how he could do this. So I showed him that there is a way in Scratch you could do this. I could go into this category. There's a button that says make a variable, and I can give the variable name score. And when I type in score, it gives you some new programming blocks. So Scratch projects are made out of programming blocks. So these are the scripts that control the behavior of this fish. Here are the scripts that control the behavior of one of the little fish. So we looked at the big fish, and I showed them that I can take out this block that says change score by one. And notice there's now a little monitor that shows the value of score. And if I click on this block, if I click, click on this block, the score increments from 0 to 1. If I click it again, the score goes up to 2. And the 13-year-old boy recognized right away that this block would be very useful to him. And if he just put the block right in the code where the big fish eats the little fish, and since he had written the code, he knew exactly where that was, then 
each time the big fish eat a little, eat a little fish, the score would go by one to three, to four, to five and six. So we tried this out and you saw it was working, he was very excited, and he reached his hand over to me and he shook my hand and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And what went through my mind was, I wondered how often are algebra teachers in the classroom thanked by their students for teaching the variables? <laughs> I don't think that happens very often. But here, I had just taught him variables and he was thanking me. So what's going on here? For me, it shows how children really care about learning mathematical ideas if it's something that they can use. Too often in the classroom, when children are introduced to concepts like variables, they have no idea why they're learning this. They're just learning it to solve a problem for their homework or for that week's exam. They have no idea how it's going to be useful in the world. But here, he was learning about variables in a way that he could make use of right away. He knew why variables could be valuable. And I think we've seen that children that learn concepts like variables in a context that they care about are likely to learn it in a deeper way and to understand it more deeply and be able to use it in later situations. And I think that's a big part of our goal in developing Scratch is to help people learn important ideas in the context of things that they really care about. Because we've seen over and over that people learn best when they're working on projects that they're passionate about, that they care about. I'm sure you've seen this in your own experience. When you think back about some of your best learning experiences, it probably wasn't when you were filling out a homework assignment. It was probably when you were working on something that you really cared about. And that's what we want to sort of emphasize that type of experience. And I think many times these days, there's a lot of talk about motivating kids by working on things that are fun and interesting. And that's good, but I want to make sure that we connect to things that they're truly passionate about for the long term. Uh, here, I think it goes deeper than just giving them a game to play with, which can be fun in the short term. But if kids learn how to create their own game, or create their own stories, it gives them something they can continue to build on over time. It's gonna have a deeper effect. So we're always looking at that as we develop new technologies. We wanna make two types of connections with our technologies. On the one hand, we wanna connect with important ideas, ideas like variables that really can be useful in many ways. But we also wanna connect with children's interests. So we're always looking how can we connect with important ideas while also connecting with children's interests. And that was our goal with Scratch. And I really, you know, that's, we we're always thinking about that as we have new features, is if you only connect with ideas without interest, kids aren't gonna pay attention. If you connect to interests without ideas, what's the point? We really wanna make sure that we connect with both of them. And that's what we're trying to do over and over as we add new features with Scratch and on all of our other projects. We also do a lot of work with the Lego company, working on Lego robotics kits. You know, we, were, we helped Lego develop the Lego Mindstorms robotics kits that I know many of you have used and I've seen in Wolfgang's lab, he's doing very creative things with them. As we worked with Lego on those kits, it was the same idea. We knew that there'd be powerful ideas that are learned when you build different robotic constructions. You learn about gearing and sensing and feedback and control we also connect with your interests. We've seen how so many people become really passionate about the things they create with an invention robotics kit like that. So let's go back to story number three. And this is a story that is about one member of the Scratch community called My Red Neptune. Since we launched the Scratch community in 2007, there have been more than 3 million young people around the world have registered as members of the community. Every day there's more than 5,000 new members of the community. So it's a very active, vibrant community with lots of people joining the community. When young people join the community, they have their own usernames that they choose. So I'm going to tell a story about one of the early members of the community whose username was MyRedNeptune. 
This is a page with some of the projects that she has shared with the community. And when my Red Neptune joined the Scratch community, one of the very first projects that she shared was a holiday greeting card that she made to share with her friends. So it was in the Christmas season, and here's the project that she shared. As you click on each reindeer, you'll see each one plays a different part of the song. interactive projects the way that we had hoped that they would, and I was happy to see it. But I wasn't so shocked or surprised by it. What Red, my Red Neptune did next did shock and surprise me. And it's one of the early of the, we've had many, many shocks and surprises over the years. Children on the website are always doing things we never imagined. One of the next projects that my Red Neptune worked on was based on the fact that she decided that what she liked to do most was to work on individual characters. We call them sprites in Scratch. So, like the reindeer, she liked to make individual characters that were animated. So she put up projects like this. It's not working now. Let's see if it works so I don't go in full screen mode. So she put on these different animations, and then in the project notes, she said, if you like any of my animations, feel free to use them in your own project. If you want a different animation, write a comment below and let me know what you would like. So basically, my Red Neptune was offering her consulting services on the website. And this is something we had never imagined. And it helped us see that young people can have very creative ways of bringing together the programming side and the community side of the Scratch website. Um, and we've seen this over and over. So in fact, in this case, we saw as my Red Neptune continued, other people did in fact start to make requests. Someone said that they wanted a cheetah. So she went and she found a video of a cheetah and she made an animation of a cheetah. Someone else asked her for a bird with flapping wings. So she made an animation of a bird. But then something else interesting happened. That, that person wrote back and they said to her, we really like you know, your animation of a bird, but I'd like to learn how to make that myself. Can you show me how you made that animation? So my Red Neptune put up a tutorial, a step-by-step -step tutorial in Scratch of how to make a bird with flopping wings. Now, when we created the Scratch website, we figured that we would put up some tutorials and some teachers would put up tutorials, but we never imagined that kids would put up tutorials. But in fact, there are thousands and thousands of tutorials that are created by kids around the world. Some of them are showing how to draw things in Scratch. Many of them are about programming features. Certain things are difficult to do in Scratch, like making a scrolling background. So lots of kids share projects of how to make a scrolling background, and they share their expertise with one another. They also share their expertise about how to uh, interact in the online community. Like there's a project called How to Get Your Projects Popular in Scratch. So there are all types of different interesting tutorials made by kids. And again, for us, that's also an important part of the learning experience of Scratch. It's not just about how to make creative projects, but also how to share your ideas. Because we know one of the best ways to learn things is to share your ideas with others, and teach your ideas to others. And we see that happening over and over on the Scratch website. We also see other types of collaboration. In addition to doing tutorials, kids will work together on projects. Like this is a project that was worked on by My Red Neptune with four other kids from three other countries. So it was five kids 
one of them made the, by the neck, they made the characters, someone else drew the backgrounds, someone else did the music, someone did the gameplay. So they were learning to work as a collaborative team, in this case, working on an adventure game. They even made a, a, a company, they called it Crank Inc., and they made a website for their company promoting their game. So it was a way for kids to start learning doing collaborations. In fact, Kids on the website, they call their groups collabs. Actually, I hadn't heard that term before, but all the kids say about creating collabs, groups for collaboration. And those are now, sort of, throughout the whole site, you see lots of collabs forming of kids learning to work together. Kids also build on each other's work, where they remix each other's projects. We tell kids that when they share projects on the Scratch website, that, that they're open to remix them, that other people can build on top of their code and on top of the images that they use by remixing. Right now, there's more than six million projects that have been shared on the Scratch website, and about 1.5 million of them are remixes, where kids are building on each other's projects. And we think that's great, the kids are learning by building on one another's projects. It also sometimes leads to some challenges on the website. Some kids will put up a project, and when someone else remixes it, the first child will say, they stole my ideas. But we explained that, in fact, in the Scratch community, that, we, that everyone is allowed to build on each other's ideas, but they should always give credit and acknowledgement. And in fact, all Scratch projects are covered by the Creative Commons for Attribution license, saying that it's open to anybody to remix the project as long as they give attribution. And in our design of the website, We've continually tried to do things to make people feel good about their projects being remixed. On the home page, we highlight projects that are the most remixed projects, because we want people to be proud, not upset, when their projects get remixed. Because we've seen how remixing helps ideas spread through the community. One of my graduate students, Andres Monroe Hernandez, who led the development of the initial Scratch website, did his PhD thesis studying remixing on the Scratch website, looking not just about the, how to you know, do the technical underpinnings for it, but studying how children start to think about the process of remixing differently as they use Scratch, um, and how they started to learn to take advantage of remixing by building each other's work, and how remixing helped ideas spread through the community so that many people in the community started working on more advanced projects than they would have otherwise. So we see the social dimension of Scratch as a critically important part of the learning experience. We often say that our main goals of Scratch, it's not just about learning computer programming, it's about learning to think creatively, reason systematically, and work collaboratively. And we think those are essential skills for everybody in today's society, regardless of where they grow up to become computer scientists or programmers or not. So I don't know if my Red Neptune will have a future doing things in computer science, but I have no doubt that the experiences she had by sharing her projects, collaborating on the Scratch website, will prepare her for tomorrow's society because she's learning to think creatively, reason systematically, and work collaboratively. For my final story, I'm gonna talk about Scratch Goes to School. When we started the Scratch website in 2007, most of the initial use was by young people using Scratch at home or in community centers. Oftentimes, it would be a parent or a relative who would tell kids about Scratch. They read about it on a blog or on a news group. They'd point kids towards it, and kids would start using Scratch on their own. And then they would tell their friends, and the community grew. But after a few years, the word started to get into schools. Schools are traditionally very slow adopters of new technologies or of new ideas in general. Uh, there's a lot of inertia in a lot of school settings. We really wanted to support the use of Scratch in schools as well as in homes and community centers because we felt that would be a way to help reach kids broadly. Not all kids grow up in households that help them learn how to navigate uh, tools like Scratch and how to make use of tools like Scratch. So we really wanted Scratch to get used in schools as well as in homes. So let me show you a few examples of ways that Scratch has started to be used in schools. This first one was from a school in Bangalore, India, where they introduced Scratch. 
And during the science class, they were studying the layers of the Earth. And this, this was from a 13-year-old who uh, then used Scratch to make his final project. It was a guided tour of the different layers of the Earth. So we called it Journey to the Center of the Earth. Okay, I don't know if you're able to hear it. So again, he's speaking in his native language of Canada, and he's explaining the different layers of the earth. His teacher explained to us that this student was really excited to learn that things are moving inside the earth. So we really want to emphasize that things are moving inside the earth. So there's a nice sound effect when he gets to the water table. So that was a case, again, where we integrated into a science class. Here's one from an elementary school in the United States where when they were reading the book Charlotte's Web, this fourth grader did a book report. One thing I like about this is, although it was part of a book report in learning about language, there was a lot of math that she was learning as part of this. As this pig gets bigger and smaller, she had to use scaling, multiplying its size by a fractional amount to make the pig get smaller as it goes on. She was also learning artistic ideas about perspective. And that's one thing that we often find in Scratch projects, that they cut across traditional disciplinary boundaries. So here she's learning about language and math and art, all as part of a meaningful project activity. Well, here's one more example from a middle school where the student, the class had been studying in social studies class, the island of Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, off of South America. And as a final project, this student decided to do a project in the spirit of Sin City. But instead of simulating the life of the city, he simulated life on the island of Rapa Nui, based on what he had learned about the history and culture of Rapa Nui. He learned that fishing was very important in Rapa Nui. So in order to survive in this game, you have to be able to fish. So you can cut down and make a fishing rod from a tree and then go fishing in order to feed yourself. But if you cut down too many trees, the God happiness goes down. That's a bad sign. So again, it was using what he had learned and then being able to show what he had learned, but also to share what he had learned with other students in the class. Actually, this example was a little different than the other ones. In the first projects, the, the teacher had introduced Scratch in the classroom, and then the teacher used it on final, and then the students used it on final projects. Here, this student had learned Scratch on his own at home, and then asked the teacher, is it okay to use Scratch for the final project? The teacher hadn't known about Scratch, but said, sure, and then he introduced it in the class, and then some of his classmates started using it as well. So we like the fact that Scratch can blur the boundaries between home and school, because we think the best tools and technologies will be ones that move across. If a technology for school is only used in schools and kids don't care to use it at home, in my mind there's something lacking about the technology. If we really want kids to get the most out of a technology, it should be something they want to use across the boundaries through all parts of their lives. And that's what we've been hoping for with Scratch. We also like the fact in these examples where Scratch was used across, the, across all disciplines. Of course, the most obvious place where you might introduce Scratch is in a computer science curriculum. And it does get used in that way in the beginning of a computer science course. But I want to say this is not just a tool for computer science, but a tool you can use for learning across the whole curriculum. Again, going back to the analogy with writing. When you learn writing, you learn about it, uh, again, here you probably learn it in German class, you learn how to write in German. But then you use it, you, you, you use your writing in all of your classes. We want the same thing. And as kids learn to code, they might learn it in a specialized class, but then use it across all of their classes, as we've seen here. That's our vision of how to do that. We've been trying to support that. Actually, one of my students, Karen Brennan, created a whole separate website called Scratch Ed, Scratch for Educators, where educators share ideas and stories about how to use Scratch in the classroom. So there's now more than 10,000 teachers around the world 
who are using the Scratch Ed website to share their curriculum plans, their lesson ideas, their assessment plans on the Scratch Ed website so that they can see how others, how they can learn to use, how they can learn to apply Scratch more effectively. So I think you've seen, we've been excited to see how Scratch has gotten out to the world and being used in many different ways by students of different ages in different countries, being used around the world in 50 different languages, both inside of schools and outside of schools. But we still see this just in the early stages of Scratch. The early adopters have been using it, and even though there's you know, thousands of new members each day, it's still a tiny fraction of the population that uses Scratch or even knows about Scratch. So I wanted to end up from going beyond these four stories to ask, what's next? As we think about it, a big part of what we think about now is how can we extend Scratch in new directions? And I think there are many different directions where we can extend Scratch. In fact, I think our visit here to Graz is part of our effort to think about extending Scratch. Over the last number of years, as we've gotten to know Wolfgang and this group, and their work on pocket code, we've been really excited about the way that they've applied ideas very similar to Scratch to use on mobile devices. And we see that's one important way of extending Scratch to reach a broader audience to so many young people around the world. Their primary interaction with digital technologies is, with, is through their phones. So we want to see how can we extend Scratch to work on phones by collaborating. That's what we've been discussing over the last few days. Another way we want to extend Scratch also connects with some of the work going on in Wolfgang's group where they've done a lot of work with Pocket Code and their other projects to connect to the physical world. So you're not just doing things on the screen, but using computation to get information from the world and to control things in the world. And we want to do the same thing. Kids grow up in the physical world. They, they're passionate about the physical world. So we want to have kids be able to connect to things in the real world. So we have several ways that we're doing it. In the past year, we extended Scratch in several ways to let it be able to use the camera, the microphone, for interacting in the world. Just to show a couple examples, if I go back to the Scratch website, here's an example of a project that uses the camera. And you can see there are these Lego mini things dropping down the screen. But the camera is also on, and now, if I come in, I can try to save the mini things from falling. So basically the camera is just recognizing motion on the screen. And what we did was we just put in some very simple new commands. And again, this is part of our design aesthetic, is to try to keep things very simple. What we did was we just added this one new command where it can detect the amount of video motion on top of a character or a sprite. And that's basically the only new command or the main new command. So in this case, it just says, if the program detects a lot of video motion on top of the sprite, then the sprite should bounce up. And then over here, we see the command, we see the procedure that defines what it means to bounce up. Or here's an example using the microphone. In this case, Notice as I talk, the back goes down. It's your job to try to get the butterfly. So you're gonna you're now in control of the game. Scratch uh, to do. 
We're also trying to, again, do more things in connecting Scratch to the physical world. So like, here's an example with a sensor board. In this case, kids are making a physical interface. This is using a light sensor. So the light sensor can detect a hole in the board. There's the board, has a light sensor. As they move the physical board, it then controls the character on the screen. So it allows kids not just to design their own games, but design their own interfaces for their games. Or one more example like this, using Lego has a robotics kit for younger kids called the Lego We Do. It has a tilt sensor and a distance sensor. So we connected those with Scratch. And here's a kid who made a driving game. So there's the tilt sensor. As you move the tilt sensor, it steers the car. On the board there is a distance sensor. As you move the distance sensor, it controls the speed of the car. So it can tell the distance sensor how far away it is from the wall there, and it controls the speed of the car. Or another kid makes it similarly, there's a boat that he's steering in a similar way. So I think you see just a way of extending Scratch again, off of the screen and into the world. Let me finish with one more extension to Scratch. This extending Scratch to new ages, reaching down in age. When we developed Scratch, we aimed at age 8 to 16. And in fact, that's been the primary use of Scratch has been ages 8 to 16. <laughs> Actually, we've been somewhat surprised and happy that it's gotten used in older ages as well. A lot of universities use Scratch, at least for the introductory part of a computer science course at the university level. At Harvard University, at Berkeley University, I hear it props here. It's, you know, it's sometimes used as an introduction. And we're very happy with that. We'd also like Scratch to go younger. And we feel the current version of Scratch is not really designed for under age eight. So for the last few years, we've been working on Scratch Junior so that young kids can start having an experience very similar to Scratch. This is aimed at age five to seven, and it just launched a couple weeks ago. It runs right now only on the iPad, but we'll go to other platforms. So right now, if I want to make the cat um, move, I can pull the block, like here's a block, it says go to the right. When I tap it, the cat goes to the right. If I want the cat to jump, this is a jump block. I tap it, and the cat jumps. I snap them together, the cat moves and then jumps. If I want to jump higher, I can change the two to a six. And now, it'll jump higher. Uh, if I want to do that repeatedly, here's a repeat block. You see there's an area in the middle for other blocks. I can drag these over. Now this should move and jump four times. Once, twice, three times, four times. If I want to like, even put on a grid, again, since it's for younger kids, we made it so that we use small integers for everything. So rather than scratch the Space goes from minus 180 to plus 180 and minus 240 to plus 240. Here it goes 0 to 20, to 0 to 15, small positive integers, which are more appropriate for 5 to 7 year olds. So we can see the cat now, he's starting at location 5, and if he goes to the right four times, he ends up at location 9, from 5 to 9, if you go 1 four times. So again, we tried to set up to make it easy for kids to start thinking about numbers. Also, you can have them say simple words. So even though we don't use language much, we have an introduction to words. There's a way you can make new pages. If we want to have the characters go to a new scene, I can choose a beach. And now they can move from the field to the beach. So it's really meant as an interactive storytelling system for kids. So, with projects like Scratch Junior, again, we're trying to get this, achieve the same types of results as we we're getting with Scratch, but again, with younger kids. Because the same way that kids learn to start to write at age five, why should they learn to code? We see it as just a new way for kids to express themselves. So it's you know, a way for them to get started. Again, we're not the same way we don't expect five-year-olds to be expert writers, we don't expect them to be expert coders. But it's a way for them to start expressing their ideas. And for us, the key point is not about learning to code, but coding to learn. And again, this comes from people who study literacy. They say that when you learn to read and write, the point is 
is not just to learn to read, but to read to learn. By learning to read, you can then read to learn many other things. When you learn to write, you can write to learn. In the act of writing, you learn to organize your ideas, to refine your thinking, so you're writing to learn. We see the same thing with coding. Our main goal shouldn't be learning to code, but coding to learn. We see this, kids start to learn to code, they do learn important concepts like variables that they show. But even more important, they learn about how to work on projects creatively, how to start with an idea, how to move to a final project, how to recognize problems when they occur and to debug them, how to collaborate with others on projects, how to break complex problems down into simpler parts. So those are all things that kids learn through coding. So they're coding to learn. And I think that's what's going to be most important for young people as they grow up today. As they grow up in a society that more than ever before demands creative thinking. We need to help young people learn to create, to learn to express themselves. We're still just at the very beginning of this journey, but we're excited to be working together with people here, like the Wolfgang and his group, but with others around the world, to try to help bring a new approach and a new way of thinking about coding, so that coding can be seen as a new form of literacy, so that all kids can grow up being truly prepared to become full and active participants in tomorrow's creative society. Thanks a lot. Well, um, usually, sometimes, other people didn't give them credit, uh, and then we would let the, the, per, the person who did the remixing, we would tell them to give credit. Uh, but that doesn't always satisfy. Some kids, even if they get the credit, they still feel it's not right. In fact, as we developed the most recent version of Scratch, we asked kids for suggestions of changes that we should make for the new generation of Scratch. And one of the most popular and common suggestions was kids want to make projects that other people could not remix. So even if they got credit, some kids did not want their things remixed because they didn't even want other people to see the code. They wanted it to be something that was only theirs. But even though a lot of kids wanted that, we said, sorry, no. You know, we feel it's important to have a sharing community. Now, so it varies with different kids. Some kids really resist it. But other kids get the idea and then embrace it and feel it's a good thing to be sharing and, you know, and will start sharing with, from others and giving credit. So I think it's different from different kids, but I think it's something that we see as one of the values of the community, so we want to try to encourage it within the community. So the, the question is about automating the process of attribution for projects. Let me go to the website, because when we first launched the website, uh, 
we did not give any type of automatic attribution. And we saw that as one of the issues that we wanted to, uh, we thought it would be good to give to make, to automate that. So the student I mentioned before, Andres Monroe Hernandez. So. It's actually here. Since I have this product up here, you see this one says this product is being remixed six times. So if I go to one of the remixes, it'll then say it automatically generates based on this project, it was based on, it was, and here's the original project. You can even go and see the remix tree. You can see this is actually remixed by someone in a different language. Um, one thing that Andre has found, it was good, I think it was good we added this automatic attribution. One thing Andre did find was he studied how much of a difference it made if there was automatic attribution versus if someone gave personal credit in their notes. And he found it made a much bigger difference if people gave personal credit. That the original author was much less likely to be upset if someone wrote a personal note compared to if there was automatic attribution. Partly based on our research, we added this new area for notes and credits. In the early version of the website, there was only a place that was for project notes. And instead of just project notes, we divided it into two areas, instructions and notes and credits, uh, because we want to highlight the importance of giving credit. So, um, so we do have ways of automatic attribution, but we still feel that that's not enough. And Andres' research showed that that wasn't as effective as people giving personal credit. So we really, now we try to do both to see, you know,
But I think we are a bit of an outlier there. The whole world is going in a direction and seeing sort of more and more extrinsic motivation, you know, through different types of, uh, often under the frame of gamification. I feel very, although it's, it's so popular in the world these days, I feel really skeptical about a lot of pieces of gamification for the reason I just explained. So I would much rather focus on kids' creations, their portfolios of their creations, as opposed to trying to lure them with different rewards and prizes. But I know there's, there's lots to discuss there, and people have very different points of view on that.
scratch the elder, the, the senior, yeah. and I have a scratch senior. But one story I'll tell is that I started out my talk talking about the Mother's Day card I sent to my mom. And my mom then tried to use scratch, and she didn't get so far with it. But last month, as we were about to launch Scratch Junior, I gave Scratch Junior to my mom, and she took to Scratch Junior much more quickly. So I now sometimes say that Scratch Junior is intended for ages 5 to 7 and over 80. Because um, I do think that the Scratch Junior fits pretty well some of the needs of seniors. And we have had, we've had some colleagues, also even with Scratch, who have run some workshops specifically for seniors who then wanted to use this with their grandchildren or to, uh, or just keep their minds alive in the time of things. So we have tried to, I, specifically for seniors, I'm not sure we need a special version. I think Scratch Junior might be okay for them. One other thing we thought about is just by the graphic imagery in Scratch, like older teens start to say, this is for young kids, it's not for me. So Scratch ends up feeling not cool for kids. You somehow, you come out of that. By the time you're in your 20s, it's okay to use something that's kid-like. But something like a 17-year-old doesn't want to be seen using something with those cartoon-like graphics. So we've thought about reskinning it and putting in different graphics to help extend the age. So that's one thing we're thinking about, how to do new types of activities new images and some new activities and new sample projects that might help extend the age upwards is one thing we are thinking about. So one question, um, does it can scratch be cool for students? Can it be cool for students? Students, like students take a year? Like in junior, university level? Yeah. Well, I do think people have different messages. Like we have you know heard that like in the Harvard introductory computer science class where they use Scratch for a short period of time. The students really like it. They find they're able to create something quickly that they find interesting. But we have heard other places, as part of some design schools, where the fact that it sort of had a cat, it didn't feel cool to some of the designers. So I think we've got different reactions from different university students. So it's something that we're still looking at, and I think it's worked in some cases, not as well as others. So, um, I think it's something that we need to do more work to, to try to make it so that it fits the needs of more university students. Since that was not our primary audience, we haven't focused on it so much. So I think there is more work that can be done to try to make sure that it's something that resonates with them, that they feel excited about the music. introduce the 
Jake Clements, who's a member of our team, who's here with us, is one of the sort of, is one of the, you know, leaders of free index to the Scratch extension system. There's a lot of issues around not just the technological infrastructure, but Shane and others are also thinking about the policy around it. How can we allow people to add their own extensions without it becoming too noisy with just all sorts of different things showing up, help people find where the most useful extension is. So those are things that we're now thinking about through hopeful extended. So it's sort of a meta feature of the way that we're saying that we're uh, not necessarily allowing people to make whole other versions of Scratch, but at least adding their own blocks to Scratch. So Scratch is not only a friendly and an editor, but also a great distribution system. Yeah. So you talked about extensions and about uh, re-implementations of similar systems like Snap, but uh, will these features be also integrated into the community system? Is it possible to share an extension within the community? So the question is, well, can you share an extension in the community? This is exactly something we're struggling with right now. Because in some ways, we'd love to share some extensions. We always want to be careful, though, that if, if the community gets too full of advanced features, we worry that an eight-year-old coming to the community would feel this isn't for me. So we're trying to figure out the right balance. So we will, if we approve extensions for sharing, then they can be added to the community. But our current plan is that we'll be the curators you know, of the extensions. So people can make extensions, share extensions with their friends who can use them privately, but to be able to share projects in the main community, we'll have to approve the extensions. That's our current plan, but it's a plan, but we're not quite sure how we're gonna do the curation, how we make the decisions of what to approve, what to, what to include, and we think that's a challenging thing to do well, but it's partly because we want to be so careful to maintain the friendliness of the community and to make sure that the easy entry path for newcomers doesn't get overridden by people doing these advanced extensions that will intimidate. So we're trying to find ways to allow more advanced features but continue to make an easy entry point and trying to figure out the right way of matching that within the community is one of the I think are big challenges for the upcoming year. Yeah, so maybe this is a good point. Um, Mitch, thank you very much for the very really interesting and inspiring talk. And we'll have the opportunity to continue discussing things with Mitch. Uh, there is a buffet prepared uh, for everyone who is interested. So First, let's thank Mitch for the talk.